over the last couple of years. But I just wanted to go through uh, a number of chapters in Isaiah uh, to compare it to the Word of God. Um, we won't go through all 66, obviously, because uh, uh, for time constraint. But some things just to show you that the Bible is just supernatural, and I left it for last because I think it's the most undeniable other than fulfilled prophecy. Um, fulfilled prophecy obviously is the best one because that's the one God tells you to, to look for. Um, <laughs> his, his opinion is a little better than mine. Um, uh, but in a sense, this is prophecy because that's the whole idea of it. The book of Isaiah, as I have mentioned, was written in 750 B.C. There are specific prophecies in it about the, the life of Jesus Christ, like he would be virgin born, like he would be a child that would be called the mighty God, the everlasting father, uh, many other things like that. But also the idea of the layout of the book and for uh, just by way of review and in case anybody wasn't here on the times I mentioned it, um, keep in mind there are 66 chapters in Isaiah, 66 books in your Bible. Anything I don't say, anything I say that doesn't make sense or you're not Either I'm not putting it on a cross right or you're missing it or something, stop me. Um, but uh, the first 39 chapters are so different from the last 27 that people have even come to the conclusion that there were two different authors. That's how different they are. Um, but in John chapter 12, Jesus Christ quotes them both and attributes them to the same author. So uh, there is one. And so you look further into why that's so different, it's because... 39 chapters match the 39 books in the Old Testament, and 27 chapters match the 27 books of the New Testament, and obviously the New Testament, the tenor of the New Testament, is much different than the Old Testament. Why? Because God has become a man. God has gone through what we've gone through. He's been tested in all points like as we are. He's learned obedience through suffering. He's, you know, I mean, he knew intellectually how that went because he's God and he knows everything. But he, it says he learned, he learned it. He learned obedience. He learned those things. Why? Because he went through them experientially as a man. And so that's why God is in a position to give more, far more grace um, after the cross than before. Uh, in the Old Testament, the emphasis, emphasis is more on mercy. I mean, I know it's on judgment and holiness, but as far as how we <laughs> avoid hell... It's mercy, mercy, mercy. You know, his mercy endureth forever. In the New Testament, the mercy doesn't go away, but grace gets added. Okay, not that there's no element of grace, but pretty much in the Old Testament, you know, there's no found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because he was a just man. Uh, I was not a just man, uh, and I didn't find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace found me, and I became justified before, the, before God. Um, so a little bit different. Uh, quite a bit different, and uh, that's pretty much, there's only a couple times grace is used in the Old Testament, it's more in that, in that line. All right, so Isaiah, the, so the last 27 chapters, it makes sense, would be different from the first 39. And then uh, keep in mind that none of the 27 books of the New Testament were written when Isaiah was penned, when Isaiah prophesied, and much of the Old Testament wasn't written. Okay, Ezekiel wasn't written, Jeremiah wasn't written, Daniel wasn't written, um, you know, Malachi wasn't written, Zephaniah, most of the prophets were not written uh, at the time. And so, you know, we'll call it half, I, I forgot to count and look, but it's say half the books of the Bible, probably a little more than half of the books of the Bible had not yet been written. And then you add to the fact, add to that, that the Hebrew Bible, their 39 books are in a different, arranged in a different order. And um, they're written by about 40 different authors on three continents over a period of 1,500 to 2,100 years, depending on when Job was written. Okay? And uh, so it, it can't possibly happen this way that chapter 1 matches Genesis, chapter 2 matches Exodus all the way through, except that it does. Okay? So I, we'll, look at, we'll look at a few. We'll look at quite a few this morning. Uh, if you don't see the connection, you can stop me. Most of them are very clear, but some are, are not as obvious. Um, in Isaiah, but the Isaiah, we won't 
uh, uh, the ones that match uh, Genesis, Malachi, Matthew, and Revelation, we won't spend much time on them. I'll just point them out since we've looked at those before. But in Isaiah chapter 1, uh, you have things that match Genesis, the, the first book of the Bible, uh, so much so that in verses 2 to 9, you have match, things that match Genesis 1 through the first nine chapters of Genesis. You have in Genesis 2, uh, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 1, 2, uh, the heavens and speaking to the heavens and the earth, which God created in Genesis 1, 1. Uh, uh, you have the creation of, of man, okay, the quote-unquote children of God and so on. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. In verse 2, that's what happened in the early part of Genesis. Um, then in verse 4, uh, you have a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. That's what you have in Genesis 4, 5, and 6. In verse 5, you have, you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. In Genesis uh, five, you have everybody dying, and he died, and he died, and he died. So-and-so lived this long, and he died. He lived that long, and he died. And so what do you have in verse 5? Because pretty much one in, um, uh, in the first three verses, you have the first three chapters of Genesis, even though it doesn't get started until verse 2. But then chapter 4 matches verse 4. Chapter 5 matches verse 5. Uh, they all die, and it's uh, why? Because the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. In verse 6, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bu bruises and putrefying sores. Uh, they have not been closed, neither uh, bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And it matches Genesis 6, 5, where violence filled the earth. And, the, and, and this, this, this sole of the foot, the head of the foot, the wounds, is talking about spiritually as well as physically um, because of their rebellion. And the physical things are, are the judgment and result of the heart. The reason we die is because of sin. The wages of sin is death. And you have in Genesis 6, uh, every imagination of the heart of man is only evil continually. Um, so then in, chap in uh, Genesis 7, uh, the whole world is desolate because it's been wiped out by a flood. And the cities were destroyed. And in verse 7, the country is desolate. Cities are burned with fire. Um, verse 8. Eight, you have a remnant that's, uh, eight and nine, you have a remnant. You have, uh, in verse eight, Zion is left as a, as a cottage and a vineyard, okay, a besieged city. What do you have? You have Noah and his family just surrounded by the whole world with nothing else going on no, in, in it. Uh, and then verse nine, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, Noah and his family, in chapter nine of Genesis. We should have been as Sodom and should have been as Gomorrah, totally wiped out. So Genesis, the first book, matches uh, the first chapter, all right? So then, uh, if, you look at, if you're in Isaiah, look at Isaiah chapter 2. And in verse 2, the Bible says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it, unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So keep a mark or a hand in Isaiah, because uh, we're going to obviously go spend the morning in Isaiah. But in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, now, we just read where they went up to the mountain of the Lord's house. It was, it was exalted. The nations are there. People are going to go there to the mountain of the Lord, and God's going to teach them to walk in his ways, and get, he's going to give them his law. Okay? What happens in Exodus, the second book? Uh, let's see. They go to the mountain. Let's see, hold on. Moses goes up to the mountain in chapter 19. In chapter 19, verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak. And then he tells them, gives them some instructions 
for cleansing themselves for the next three days. And then verse 12, And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touch the mount shall be surely put to death. And so they go up to the base of the mountain. And on verse 16, It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people trembled that was in the camp. Uh, verse 18, And Mount Sinai was all together on smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And uh, verse 19, The voice of a trumpet sounded. And uh, verse 20, The Lord came down upon Mount Zion. And what's he going to say to them? You get to chapter 20. And he says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then he goes through the Ten Commandments and other things. So the law comes down to the mount and goes out in the second book of the Bible. All right. Uh, let's, let's skip up to Numbers, uh, which would be the fourth book. And Numbers chapter 9. And we, I mean, we could have done Leviticus, but we can't do them all, so I'm just picking some. Numbers chapter 9, verse 15. And on the day that the tabernacles, tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So Isaiah chapter 4. Verse 5, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of a fly, flaming fire by night, upon, for upon all the glory shall be the defense. So you've got dwelling place here, you've got the appearance of the fire during the night, and you've got a cloud during the day in the fourth book and in Isaiah chapter number 4. All right, Isaiah chapter number 6. Very familiar passage, both of these. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. In the, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, also, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. So you have a man here seeing God. Okay. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So you've got a man seeing the Lord, and the idea is that he's overwhelmed with is holiness. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the post of the door, of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then, I, then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. All right? Um, and then he's going to, kind of an, 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 a bizarre thing in verses 6 and 7, the seraphim's going to touch his tongue with a coal, which purges his iniquity and takes it away. That's a separate study. <laughs> and we'll do that if I ever understand it. I have, I have a little bit, but not enough to teach on. Um, <laughs> But anyways, keep those things in mind and go to Joshua chapter 5. Now, Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible. It is also the first book in the Bible named after a man. Six in the Bible is the number of man. And in the fifth chapter of the sixth book, you have a man meeting God and being faced with his holiness. Verse 13, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us, or art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord's ho of the excuse me, captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him what saith my lord unto his servant 
And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So this happens to be in the sixth chapter. I mean, Joshua is over 20 chapters long, if I remember right. I think. Yep. Uh, 24, 25, whatever chapters. And uh, um, yeah, it just happens to be in the sixth chapter that he, six, uh, six excuse me. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and it just happens that in the sixth one matches what's going on in the sixth book of the Bible. Okay, I, I get turned around going back and forth on this. I, I have such a hard time with the numbers on this. I think in numbers, too. You'd think I wouldn't have any problem, but I'm like, six books, six chapter, chapter six. Especially, and then it's like, wait, wait a minute, that's in chapter five in Joshua. I thought it was in six. No, six is in Isaiah. So if I get a little crazy for a minute... Just let me back up, and I'll clear my head, and I'll, and I'll be back on it, okay? Uh, so Judges. And there's 24 chapters in Joshua, which had nothing to do with what I, with, with chapter 6. Uh, so in Judges, you have um, a couple of things, all right? So get Judges 7 in one hand. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I did it again. Judges 16 in one hand and Isaiah 7 in another. So in Isaiah 7, verse 20, the Bible says, In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely, by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. Kind of a bizarre story sentence, except that in the context, read the whole thing, it's not, but, you know, for us poking our head in here and looking at the chapter, it's kind of an odd statement to be in the Bible, um, but with that there, hold your, uh, look over in Judges 16 and verse 17. That he told her all his heart and said unto her, this is Samson and Delilah. There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength shall go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now just think about what an unusual topic this is for the Bible anyways. And right there in Isaiah 7, we're talking about the Lord shall, you know, shall the Lord shave with a razor and you know, the beard and the hair, the feet and all this stuff. And yet, there you are in the seventh book of Judges. It's one of the most well-known incidents in the chapter. I mean, Samson and Goliath, I mean, it's one of the, even in the lost world, Samson's one of the most famous people in the world. Everybody knows it's because Delilah got him to cut his hair off, you know. And uh, yet, there it is. Um, let's see. Uh, there's another connection to this. Uh, go back to Judges 13, a couple pages. There's another connection to Isaiah 7 in Judges. Sometimes there's many connections, and I'm just mentioning one or two. Usually there's one. There's one that, out of that I found. Maybe there's more that I'm not seeing, but uh, usually there's one key one. But several, of, uh, a few of them have several, and several of them have a couple. Isaiah uh, Judges 13, <laughs> verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. So here you have a woman of Israel, of the tribe of Dan, who uh, was barren. Okay? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine or strong drink, and eat any other thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a, a Nazarite unto God from the womb. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. The first three verses are the most obvious, but I went to verse 5 because it's someone who's going to deliver Israel. Okay, um, But here's someone, here's a woman who's barren, who has 
who has not had a child, and the angel of the Lord is going to answer her prayer. Um, it doesn't say here she's praying. Other passages get that. But um, if I'm not hallucinating. And the angel of the Lord appears on her and tells her she's going to have a son, and so on. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And when you go to Matthew 1 and Luke 1 and 2 and see the fulfillment of this, you also have the angel of the Lord appearing to Mary and telling her all these same things that we're familiar with. Okay? So you have a supernatural, miraculous birth uh, uh, prophesied, and although... Uh, Manoah's wife was not a, a virgin. She was barren, and it was uh, answered by the angel of the Lord, and it was directly from God that she would bear a child. All right? Uh, 1 Samuel. We'll skip over Ruth to, for a time's sake, but Ruth is, one of those one, Ruth is the only one that I didn't see a direct connection to. Maybe there is one that I missed. But it was kind of interesting because Ruth, there's an indirect one, because Ruth um, marries Boaz and so on. You know that story. And the end of the book of Ruth, it talks about uh, he's the father of Jesse, the father of David, and, and, and so on. And all the way down, Obed beget Jesse, Jesse beget David, and, so, and all that. And it corresponds one book removed. Like in Matthew, you have the fulfillment of this, and you have this genealogy, you have the complete one, with Boaz and Ruth being in the line of Christ. It's, uh, this is a portion of the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, and there are things that in the corresponding chapter, in Isaiah 8, that go with Matthew. So it's kind of a double connection, but it takes a little while it's obvious when you lay it out, but it takes a little while. That's why I didn't go into it this morning. But I just throw it out there because to, for you to uh, think about and look at in your, uh, in your own study. Um, but 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 28. I mean, just think of the odds of this. And like I said, you know, I've quite a number of times mentioned one chapter or something, but since we're on how do we know the Bible's the Word of God, I just figured I would spend one week and go through a bunch. And I guess now when I do my one thing for, at the beginning for a while, I'm going to have to go, go a total of different route. So, All right, so in 1 Samuel 28, verse number 17. <clears throat> I think that's what I want. Yes. And the Lord hath done to him, as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee. Unto thee. So here we are in the ninth book of the Bible, and we're going to talk about God giving the kingdom to David. All right, so in Isaiah chapter 9. Most of you probably know what verse I'm going to because it's very famous. Verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now watch. Of the increase of his government, and of peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with ju judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the, uh, of the Lord of hosts not only will perform this thing, but the zeal of the Lord of hosts has laid it out where it just keeps matching. I mean, over and over and over. All right, uh, let's see. Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 11 in one hand, and Isaiah 10 in another hand. Verse number 14. This is David with Uriah the Hittite. 
uh, 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 Second Samuel, sorry, Second Samuel 11. No, where am I? 11.14. Oh, that's the thing where I, I'm like, so I thought it was supposed to be 10, but that's Isaiah. <laughs> that just messes with me. Some days more than others. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 14. And it came to pass as the morning, uh, in the morning that David wrote a letter and, uh, uh, to, to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and ye retire ye from him that he, that he may be smitten and die. So David writes this uh, letter to Joab, and it's an evil letter. But it's a command from the king, so it's an unofficial decree. It's not one he posted for the whole country, you know. It's a special ops letter here, classified. And, um, but when you go to Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that write grievousness which they have prescribed. And David did get some heavy woes as a result of that. In fact, that's the only issue God ever mentions that he has against David ever. He just says, you know, David was great, David was this, he was that, save in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. You know, that's the, um, the one thing. But it was an unrighteous uh, decree. All right, let's, uh, let's skip up to Esther. Esther chapter number 7. And the reason I mention about when it was written and compared to when all the other books of the Bible were written and all the things that I said in the preface was because, you know, there's always somebody trying to say, well, you know, it was written after the fact. You know, the book of Daniel, the reason Protestant, Catholic, and liberal Jewish scholars uh, don't want to say Daniel was inspired is because they don't like what it says. It's it, it just, you know, especially the, the liberal rabbis because... Um, the conservative rabbis don't like it, but they they just but they also believe that it's, you know they they're kind of torn. They they don't do with it. But if Daniel belongs in the Bible, then four hundred three eighty three years after the decree of to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah is anointed, and after that, whether it's a day after that or three and a half years after that or whatever, sometime after that, he's cut off. Well, you know, and you only have 490 years till everything's reconciled and all that. So if Daniel is prophetic, they've missed it. So that's I can understand why they don't like it. Um, but Daniel is so specific, specific. And so what do they do? They no, they want to say it was written later, after in you know a couple centuries before Christ. There's no way they can say it was written after that because people in Jesus' day, including Jesus, are quoting it. Um, the problem with that is there are prophecies in there that happened, you know, Rome wasn't in power even when they say it was written, so you still have prophecies about Rome that they can't get around. And um, it, it, and, it, uh, and, and then when Ezekiel, who's a contemporary of Daniel, God talks to him and says, you know, talks about Noah and Moses and Daniel how great they are. So what do they do? They grasp at straws and they say, well, it wasn't that Daniel, it was some unknown Daniel. Really? When you're trying to write to these people, you're, you're picking two fa famous people that everyone knows about, Noah and Moses, and then you throw in a third person that no one ever heard of. When, when you have this Daniel who everybody's heard of. So everybody knows, I mean, the, the, the arguments are ridiculous. But people try. The point is people will keep trying. What do you do with Isaiah? How are you going to do this? I mean, you know, all the liberals were thrilled when the Dead Sea Scrolls came out because now they're going to see how different it is from our Bible now. Basically, the book of Isaiah from before the time of Christ was virtually identical to, to, our, to the Hebrew ones today, except they didn't use vowel points, which Hebrew, the, you know, Hebrew, the Hebrew language is in consonants. 
And sometimes they put vowel points on it to make it easier to read, and sometimes they don't. Someone who's highly skilled doesn't need the vowel points. My personal theory is they added they, they have the vowel points when it's something they don't care about, when they, they, they take the vowel points away to make it harder for outsiders to read when they want to. But that's, that's not scripture. That's just for whatever it's worth. But the point is it was the, it was the same. It hadn't changed. The Bible hadn't changed in centuries. And um, so the book of Isaiah, what, what are you going to do? They know it, it wasn't written yet when Isaiah penned this. But yet, here it keeps matching up all the way through. So in Esther, the 17th book of the Bible, you have the story of Haman, the account of Haman. That's why they, I think it's Hanukkah, right? One of the, one of the holidays is, about, is, what is it? Right, right. And, and that's, that goes back to Esther, right, to this incident. Okay, I'm just making sure I wasn't mixing up my holidays. And um, uh, this is when Haman tried to get the Persian Empire to wipe them all out and so on. And he ends up uh, being hung on a tree. And if you, so hold Esther 7 there and go to Isaiah 17, verse number 14. And it says in Isaiah 17, 14, Behold at eventime trouble, and before the morning he is not. As in Revelation, the beast that was and is and is not. Okay, so he's dead if he is not. Okay, uh, behold, even time trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. So in Esther seven verses eight to ten, it's exactly what happens here. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the bank banquet of wine. The banquet was taking place in the evening. And Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So this went uh, intended to spoil them. He had trouble in the evening, and by morning he is not. I mean, just exactly what it said in Isaiah. All right, or, or yeah, in uh, yeah Isaiah seven fourteen. All right, uh, let's see. Just by as a note, uh, we won't look at it. Um, chapter twenty, Isaiah twenty. Is not what we typically would consider a proverb, but you can show through the Bible that there are stories of not. No, I don't mean story, but as in not true. Okay, there are history stories. There are true accounts. You know, this is a true story. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but in chapter twenty, uh, you know, it matches. Proverbs is the twentieth book of the Bible. Well, chapter twenty is a proverb. I mean, it is a proverb. Uh, there's in chapter 19, there's several things from the Psalms, and we won't look at that. But um, look at Isaiah 23. Isaiah 23, because Isaiah is the 23rd book of the Bible. And Isaiah 23 starts out with, in verse 1, the burden of Tyre. Well, a good example is Isaiah 22, but you can go throughout the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a book of burdens. <laughs> I mean, Isaiah has more burdens than any other book. It's the burden of Moab, the burden of Ammon, or Ammon the burden of so-and-so, you know. And this is the burden of Tyre. And so even chapter 23 is a burden uh, which matches the idea of that's a, it's a major theme of Isaiah. All right, Matthew 3. Matthew 3. Let's do a couple in the New Testament before we stop. Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew's the 40th book, <clears throat> so we get Isaiah 40 in one hand, and Matthew, the 40th book, chapter 3 in another hand. Aren't you glad we're not comparing three? That's why I didn't do Ruth, because we would need three hands. <laughs> in Isaiah 40, 
verse number 3. You have the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway of, for our God. The 40th book, Matthew 3, verse 3, quotes that verse. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. All right. Uh, go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Verse 45, now Jesus, who we know is a carpenter, even though that's not mentioned here, says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life, to give his life a ransom for many. Isaiah 41, verse 7, So the carpenter encouraged the, the goldsmith, and he that smoothed while the hammer, him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, who I have chosen the seed um, of Abraham, my friend. So what did Jesus do? He ministered. He didn't come to minister, to be ministered unto. He ministered. So what does the carpenter do? He encourages. He smoothed it. He said it's ready. He fastened it. He did these things. He's, help, he's being, what's he doing? He's helping, okay? He's, uh, ultimately he's going to deliver, but we're just talking about what does he do? He, he serves. He ministered. You minister, you're going to minister to somebody, you're going to admonish them, you're going to encourage them, you're going to, you know, strengthen them, edify them, and so on. All right? Uh, let's see. Uh, a couple more. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Verse number 32, a light to lighten the Gentiles in the glory of thy people Israel. Isaiah 42, verse number 6, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, I will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles. <laughs> oh, let's see, let's see if we let's jump up. We won't do, we've done Revelation before, we've done Jude before, we've done a lot of these before. Let me see. We've done Romans before, the Corinthians. Colossians is kind of complicated. Let's do first and second Thessalonians and we'll close. First Thessalonians. I like Jude. It starts talking about people rebelling in a garden. <laughs> and and uh, Enoch is in Jude, right? You go back to never mind. Can't get, I can't. I want to do it all, but I can't. All right. So I, you got First Thessalonians four, and go to Isaiah fifty-two, verse nine. In fact, we'll stop with this because I believe I have done Isaiah fifty-three. Isaiah fifty-two, verse nine. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people; he hath redeemed Jerusalem. Now I know it's talking about Israel. Okay. The Lord hath made Bear his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Verse 11, depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. For I would not, brethren, you sh I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So he's going to redeem the bodies of them. Uh, we're waiting for the redemption of our body. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain uh, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Depart ye, depart ye. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So that's the 52nd chapter and the uh, 52nd book and the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. And you could do all 66. But, um, you know, I've, I've noticed, I've mentioned it before, and I've used some examples in the past, but that's about 20 examples, I think, something like that. So um, we'll stop with that. So next week we will. 
uh, take our, our final week of our study since we finished. I keep finished in this group one week earlier than the other one, but that's not all bad. Um, so we can take this opportunity to um, look at where Israel and the world seem to be at this point compared to prophecy. I will, I will not sensationalize and do the thing in the 70s and say California will fall off the ocean by May. Okay, I'm not going to do that. It'll, it'll, we'll just, but we will see what's going on currently in the world and compare it to the Word of God. All right, you're dismissed. Jesus, my Savior and Lord, you do I trust and adore. I long now to serve you, I'll never deserve you, Jesus, my Savior and Lord. Jesus, my Master and King. Honor and praises I sing Search me and know me Try me and show me Jesus my master and king Jesus most high El Shaddai Giver creator of life Keep and deliver Lord, draw me near to Thee, Jesus, Most High El Shaddai. Jesus, my Savior and Lord, you do I trust and adore. I long now to serve you, I'll never deserve you, Jesus, my Savior and Lord. I long now to serve you, I'll never deserve you. Jesus, my Savior and Lord. From the tomb I could see midst the lightning and thunder, a tiny ship about to go under and i laugh as they tried in vain rough waters to hold something happened then i'll never forget and i still don't quite understand how a man in the boat could keep them afloat with just a wave of his hand he calmed the storm on the sea that was raging. Still the tempest that nature was waging against their battered form. And there came a peace. Angry winds were silent. The water lay still that once was so violent. And there's something about the man who calmed the storm. Many times they would try, but no one could tame me. Even chains could never contain me. And I'd run to the cold, dark tomb and dwell there alone. Till the man on board the boat came ashore, would calm the storm on the sea. At his feet I would fall, cause I knew he could calm the storm that was raging in me. He calmed the storm in 
my heart that was raging, still the tempest that Satan was waging against this battered form. And there came a peace, angry voices were silent, such a calm man that once was so violent. And there's something about the man who calmed the storm. I wanted to go and live at his side, cause there's no place I'd rather be. But until that day, he wants me to stay and tell what he's done for me. He calmed the storm in my heart that was raging. Still the tempest that Satan was waging against this battered form. 